Hello everyone, this is Pamela Fagan Hutchins and I'd like to welcome you to the podcast and videocast versions of Wine, Women and Writing. This is the show where I talk to other authors about their characterization primarily because I'm so fascinated with how we can take fictional characters and make them live, breathe real, authentic, complex characteristics into them. So today I'll be talking with someone about that. But first, a few announcements. Um, this is a copyrighted and solely on production of Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. Need you to know that. And if you want to see the schedule of past shows or upcoming shows and read along with the books, check it out on my website, PamelaFaganHutchins.com, where you can also find my new releases. I'm super excited about the uh, latest Patrick Flint book, Scapegoat, which came out last month and came out this week, my first children's book, Poppy Needs a Puppy, with a free companion song download from a Grammy-nominated uh, musician. Kind of super cool. And last but not least, um, on that website as well, you can see that I have one spot left for next week's advanced marketing and advertising for uh, publishing success. So check it out there. And enough with that. Let's get to the fun stuff, the reason you're here. And that's today's guest, Libby fisher Hellman, who's here to talk about her new book, A Bend in the River. Libby is a friend of mine, and I read Libby's books. Mm -hmm. So that's the double whammy of um, recommendation there. Welcome to the show, sweetie. Thank you. I read your books, too. So, <laughs> so it's a duo. It's a duo. <laughs> Thank you. I'm really happy to be here. I, I love it. And I think that for the people on video that you are getting a treat because you not only get to see Libby's smiling face, but that's her book cover behind her there looking all gorgeous. Yeah, it, it kept uh, falling down. So we had gaffer's tape keeping it up. And finally, we put gaffer's tape over the whole thing and it stayed up so far. <laughs> <laughs> that's high tech. That is, that is living yeah, on the edge. <laughs> yeah, you know, some people get on here and they do a digital background and have all that in there, but we get gaffer's tape when it's Libby and me. So uh, we're, I'm actually coming to uh, everyone from the basement of our lodge in Wyoming right now. And I was telling Libby before we started, I was in a room with a really pretty background, but my husband was being too loud on a Zoom call. So I came into the basement. So I'm keeping it dark so you can't see what's behind me. But you <laughs> see what's beside me and, you know, and all the lights, you know, I've rigged this thing up. So <laughs> for, for, for exactly this kind of thing. So. <laughs> well, I want you to tell everybody about a bend in the river for those that are not yet familiar and haven't been smart enough to pick it up and read it. So it is a, it's a departure for me. Usually I write crime fiction, um, but this is straight historical fiction. Now I have written some historical thrillers, but this is not a thriller and it's not a mystery. It is a historical fiction about two sisters in Vietnam during the Vietnam War. And it kind of tells the story of the war from their perspective. And we follow each sister. They're very different people. And in fact, they have a big fight sort of in the beginning of the book and they separate and one becomes a bar girl in Saigon catering to US uh, GIs and the other fights for the Viet Cong. Oh, wow. So that's kind of what happens and they're they're apart for at least 10 years and then I can't tell you the rest because. <laughs> Spoiler alert. And, okay, so as you said, this is a departure for you. Tell me how, after you've had this long and successful career in crime fiction, you found this idea and had, honestly, folks, the courage to run with it because it's hard <laughs> to tr give it so much of your time to something new and untested. So where did it come from? And how did it um, so great? I went to Vietnam with a friend and I went because I was, I'm old enough to have protested against the war when I was in college. And I wanted to see the place that took over 50,000 of lives, mm -hmm. the young men and some of whom I knew. Um, and so when we were in Vietnam, we were in, we walked into an art gallery and there was the picture of those two sisters on the wall without of course the title and everything. And I looked at it and I went like this and I went like this and I said, I'm going to write a book about this. And my friend who knows me very well, she's a librarian, by the way, looked at me and she said, of course you are. I knew that. And I said, well, I, don't, I didn't know that. <laughs> and I said, it's going to be about two sisters. And she said, yep. So I bought the painting. I brought it home. 
And we, I immediately started thinking while I was still there, you know, what kinds of things could happen. And I started talking to people and I asked to interview people. I asked my tour guide if he could set me up with a North Vietnamese, a former North Vietnamese army person. And he did. Oh, wow. Then I talked to a couple other people while I was there. And then the real research, aside from the, you know, hundreds of pictures I took, uh, happened when I got home yeah. and um, did much more research. Um, and you know what, Pamela, this was in some ways the easiest book for me to ever have written. Oh. I don't know. Yeah. I think it's because it was such a foreign place for me. And I knew so little about Vietnamese culture or history that when I learned something that I thought was kind of interesting, I'd make a note of it and I'd wonder if I could get it into the book somehow. So I ended up with, you know, like 10 or 12 different scenarios that all worked kind of organically into the story, into the plot. And um, in a way, you know, you know, when you're doing crime fiction, you have to be so careful about your plotting and your red herrings and 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 the obstacles that the the protagonists um, face. Well, in this one, I just was it was easier. It was just sort of organic. It all came. Not that they didn't have obstacles. They had horrible obstacles and, and both of them suffered immensely during the war. But um, it was just it was surprisingly easier to write than I thought it would be. That's super interesting. It, it sounds freeing, actually, to go out of the constraints of genre and tell a story. Exactly. Right? You exactly. told an adventurous no. story, a saga. You know, if I, had another, if I had another good idea, I'd probably write that, but I don't. I mean, I, <laughs> oh, I don't know. Oh. Now you're going to have all these historical fiction readers that are going to be like, where's the next one? So now that's got to be interesting, too, that you've got some of your readership that will follow you just because they love you. But you're going to have other mm -hmm. readers that come in because they enjoy either historical fiction or they enjoy reading about things about Vietnam or that era. Right. And are you starting to hear from any of those readers with their well, stories? Some are saying, I want, we want a sequel, you know, um, and um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I left, you know, the ending is, is a, possible, but it would be, I, I'm not, I'm not interested in doing that, but yes. And there are a couple people that did not want to read it and told me so, and wrote me and said, you know, I was there and, you know, I think what you're doing is wrong. And we were there, you know, we were there for a good reason and I don't want to read your book. Yeah. I, okay. I understand, you know, not everybody's going to like, you know, like the premise. So, right. but and enough are that I'm, I'm delighted and surprised and, and uh, thrilled. <laughs> so, with your experience having lived through the era, did you go in with knowing the kind of story that you wanted to tell, or was it more that you saw this picture and it spoke to you? Uh, uh, you know, was there, did it end up being healing or cathartic for you as somebody? Because it was a hard period of time to yeah. live through. It did because um, I was able to tell the other side of the story and the Vietnamese suffered much more than we did. Right. I mean, right. You know, hundreds of thousands, if not a million Vietnamese died mm -hmm. during, during the war and had died when the French occupied Vietnam and they were fighting the French. So this was not a, this was not a new situation for them. And I discovered the beauty of the Vietnamese culture and the beauty of the women they're just gorgeous over there. Um, I discovered like, here was, here's, here's a nugget that I, that I discovered of all of the countries in Southeast Asia, Vietnam was considered the most sophisticated because of the French occupation. The French made sure that people were literate. They made sure that um, people had jobs in the bureaucracy. Um, they made sure that, you know, they, they tried to instill some French culture in Vietnam and to a certain extent it took. So when people were looking in, in China and Japan for, for it, people to work for them, they always wanted the Vietnamese first. 
because that's they were the smartest and the most polished and the most sophisticated. So and that, the, that. they have just, like you said, endured countless years of occupation and of bloodshed and of war. And, mm -hmm. you know, something that we've not endured over here as the conquerors. But to a certain extent, you think about all of the, the literature involving Native Americans, for instance, and their experience somewhat exactly. similar. Yeah. And, yeah. and you I, would know that in your, in your neck of the woods. Well, yeah. I, I yeah. find it really interesting that when you go to um, monuments around here, I live in Wyoming. So monuments around here that are about the late 1800s, the, you know, Indian Wars, here, there we go, Indian Wars, that they have been replaced from the old versions to tell both sides of the story and so the sh show the suffering on both sides. But when you don't live within that culture, we don't live in Vietnam, it's easy for us not to dwell on that. Right. And, and to look at them as the enemy. Right, right. It was easy to look at them and yeah. And I'm not, I mean, I'm not making excuses for the Viet Cong because, or the North Vietnamese, they did terrible things to their prisoners, but so did the US and so did the Australians who had a, a fairly large presence in Vietnam too. I mean, worse, worse, worse kind of, worse kind of brutal. Yeah. yeah. You don't succeed at it if you keep white gloves on, you know? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That is so there was that too. Yeah. It's it's a hard thing for me to wrap my mind around because like we're saying, we haven't had to face it. Not here. It hasn't been our choices to have to make. We weren't separated from a sister by war. You know, it's just not the life we live here. So mm -hmm. now, how did you get into the minds of these two women? Let's talk about characterization. How did you come up with the things that make them so amazing on the page? Um you know, it, that was so much fun. Well, there was 17-year-old Tom and 14-year-old Mai. So in some sense, this was also a coming-of-age story, although yeah. I, I don't really emphasize that. And at the very beginning, Mai, the younger one, is kind of a brat. Um, she's, you know, she thinks she knows it all, and she's the beauty of the family. And all she cares about are uh, uh, is having her parents arrange a marriage with the next village, the sampan maker's son, because he's wealthy and he's handsome. And Tom is three years older and she's more of an academic and she's more cerebral. And um, she kind of scoffs at her sister for being so superficial. And uh, uh, an event happens at the very beginning of the book. What happens is that uh, there's a massacre of her village, of their village on the Mekong River while the two girls are doing laundry on the river and they are the only survivors of the entire village. And so they are, they, they see their parents die, they see their little brother die and um, they go a little nuts and then they try to make their way to Saigon because they don't really know where else to go and Saigon isn't that far away. And they have very different experiences while they're going to Saigon. You know, my chafes at Tom trying to tell her what to do and how to do it. And then um, Tom gets uh, impatient with her because she won't do what, what Tom says and doesn't realize she's trying to protect her sister. So there's all of that com coming in. And then when they do get to Saigon, they go to a refugee camp and um, they get a job at a restaurant. Both of them get jobs at a restaurant and things seem to be on the men. They're going to make it. And then somebody comes and steals everything that they have bought with their first paycheck uh, in their in their refugee tent. And Mai just says, I'm out of here. I'm done. I'm done. And Tom is like, you know, she's desperate. She, she, she's really angry at her sister, but she kind of understands, you know, she thinks she's failed. Mm -hmm. And there they go their separate ways and they go uh, various. Tom is the one that fights for the, for the Viet Cong. And Mai is the one that gets job as a hostess at the, at the fictional Stardust nightclub. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh my God, I hope that wasn't loud in anybody's ear. I it must be have company or something because I sneezed. It almost said burp. So okay, so you and I have talked some about what it's like as authors to create worlds in our books. Libby and I, as I said, are friends. And that when you write a book, 
even if your protagonist looks just like you, you still create a whole world of characters with different characteristics that are diverse from you in many ways, because that's what the world looks like. And as authors, I think it would be fair to say that you and I both think that if you can't deliver that, you can't deliver a good book. And you've, and you've taken it to a new level here by well, I, putting I the focus. I have to admit that on that part of the book, I had some help. I knew that I could not, I mean, there are a lot of honorifics and ways that people address each other in Vietnam that are very different than what we do here. You know, you address your elders as aunt and uncle, even if they're not, and the elders address the younger people in a certain way. I found a Vietnamese editor who helped oh, wonderful. all of that. And she, um, she, she's a second generation American, but she lived in Hanoi for three years on, on a grant. And so she was able to really tell, she knew Vietnamese history better than I did. Um, she lived half of it. And she was able to, to correct some of the mistakes that I would be, have been very embarrassed to have left in. But more important, she was able to add the honorifics, the way people called each other and the, addressed each other and tell me things like Vietnamese are not at all affectionate. I had two characters holding hands. She said that would never happen even today in Vietnam. A man and a woman just don't hold hands. There's some little things like that. She That's really fantastic. Yeah, it really helped me with the culture, with the cultural heritage part of it. So, so what it, to me is fantastic about you telling the story and about any writer telling any story is that we all do what, whatever it is we have to, to get the story right. But if we don't do that story, it doesn't get told. So you see this picture and you're inspired and you're enraptured and you're in love and you come back and you use your particular skills and gifts to research, to find people to help you to deliver what is frankly yeah. now being reviewed in a stunning fashion. I would say this is your tour de force, right? I mean, this is, this is, this Might is be we'll see. We'll I mean, see. You've written a lot of great crime fiction, but this is a, an amazing book. Thank you. Thank you. It was yeah, different, right. and I'm and I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out. I just can't see you not doing another someday. I just can't. I will. I will <laughs> do another. I had an idea for something in the McCarthy era, but it kind of fell flat in my head. So if I can re you know, yeah, like that. It, that might be something to go for. Yeah, we'll that would be fun too. There's a lot, there's a lot to work with there. Yeah. Now, what are you working on now? What do you work on after you've done something so emotional? You take a break. <laughs> I'm taking a break. I did two books this year, which is really yeah. unusual for me because I'm a slow writer. But I did um, a little novella, which was a transitional, it's called Virtually Undetectable. It was yeah. a transitional book for my Ellie Foreman series where I'm turning the series over to Ellie's daughter, Rachel. I so love that. This was a transitional book. I mean, Elia will always be around because she's got a great sense of humor, if nothing else. But um, this was the transitional book. And then I also did this book. So I'm, I'm not going to pick, I'm not putting any pressure on myself. I wouldn't if I were you either. And now Ellie also appears in the Georgia uh, books she as does. well. So, so you've she got does. a lot of worlds that cross. Yeah, and I do. I love that. Don't you? I do. I love that as well. I do. I'm already trying to think of how you could get your um, women from a bend in the river, you know, as old, to appear in some community um, where there's a, uh, they're much older, but in a contemporary book. But be funny. It would be fun. A cameo, if you will. <laughs> okay, one little story. And then I know uh, the way that I found my Vietnamese editor, I was asking everybody in the world. It was Facebook and, and Twitter and, and my friends and everything. So talk about crossing worlds. I was at a water aerobics class, not this past summer, but the summer before. And I'm like, just anybody know anybody in you know vietnamese who'd be willing to work with me and my aerobics instructor did you're kidding oh, she's the one that set me up initially with a an american uh refugee who came over who was a boat person and that started the ball rolling so talk about crossing two worlds That's there's an aerobics instructor who was very friendly with chi yeah so. Well, you know, it just goes to show it never hurts to ask. You're right. thinking, I've got to go the all these, jump through these hoops and go these routes to find this professional. 
Well, somebody's going to know somebody. Just keep talking about it. Exactly. I, I love that. I love that. And uh, well, you know, I think that, you know, a, a sequel with her might be, you know, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> well, you know, I, for one, hope you get back to writing soon. I selfishly also do love your crime fiction. I hope you don't give that up. I hope that you keep a toe in each pool of water. Yeah, it's just I write so slowly. Uh, you know, I mean, I don't know how you do it so quickly because I'm, okay. you know, I have a general idea right now for a Georgia book, but yeah. I have, you know, it's going to take me a year to finish it. Or at least nine months. I've been I've been called the Energizer Bunny, and nobody needs it as a compliment. I wear people out, and I wear myself out, and it's terrible. So you be you, and that's awesome. And I'm going to try to be somebody else because I'm tired. <laughs> 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 well, you guys, I hope you've enjoyed um, this chat with Libby about A Bend in the River, and I hope you pick it up and give it a look, um, a long look, and read every single page. It's really beautiful, and the reviews are fantastic. If you want to, as I said earlier, see the upcoming shows, if you want to go back and try to find this show again later, all you got to do is go to my website, and you'll find a page that has the show on it. You'll also find my books there, which you can read for free on Kindle Unlimited. Um, or you can get the paperbacks or audiobooks anywhere online. You can also ask your library or bookstore to order them if they don't carry them. Libby's books, there we Same go, thing. Libby's books or mine. Always ask. 100% success rate if you ask um, on my books and you don't get what you want unless you ask your water aerobics instructor. That's the <laughs> moral of the story. Pamela, this was really fun. <laughs> it was fun. It's great to see you again. And I can't wait to, uh, to hear more about what's going on with you. Everybody out there, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time. <laughs>